Well, I want to take a lot of questions from everybody, but I have one question for both of you. All right. You guys have worked together for over 40 years now. Yep. Do you remember, each of you, do you remember the first day you guys met? Uh, no, I don't no, remember. No, not really. <laughs> Yeah, that was too long ago. <laughs> I, was, I think we were all too excited to have a new cast member, two new cast members, both Emilio Delgado as Luis and Sonia Manzano as Maria. Yeah. So that was, right. that was a wonderful new addition. Yeah, that was back in uh, 19... Blah, 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 blah. I would say uh, 69, <laughs> 70, 71 probably. No. <laughs> third, third year of the show. Some of these people in, don't know about that. 69, 70, 71, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been some wonderful years. Uh, does anybody have a question to start us off? Anybody here seen Sesame Street growing up? Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. We, we call you our Sesame Seeds. Yeah. <laughs> Alumni. You sprouted up like crazy. Yeah, no, no, speak into it though for the microphone yeah. for the camera. Um, I'm sorry, what's the name? My name's William. William? Development and also, um, did you know like immediately when you guys started filming Sesame Street that you guys were onto something like something that was going to carry on in just society, like worldwide famed, and just like something that carries on even to this day? That are still, you know, children are watching and growing up on Sesame right. Street. Right. Uh, I'll go because I was two years ahead of him. Uh, I had no intention of being involved, although I did. Uh, prior to that, I had, while I was getting a master's degree at Manhattan School of Music in New York City, where I met my wife, uh, I was teaching music for two years in a private boys' school. So I had some teaching experience as well as a lot of performing prior to that. But after that, and I'll cut to the quick on this, I got lucky in Japan and I made nine trips to Japan as a solo performer. It was a heartthrob in Japan. <laughs> a heartthrob. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had a big, well, I went over with Mitch Miller. Some of you probably may or may have never Mitch heard. Who? That was a big, big show on NBC. And the NHK program, the largest television, picked it up in the second year about when I started doing solos. So, interesting, we went over and we had four or 5,000 teenagers at our concerts. Here, our audience was much, much, much older, from 50 on till you died, and we were surprised, but they said charmingly, we said, why are you watching uh, Sesame Street? And they said, or Mitch Miller, why are you watching Mitch Miller? And they said, we watch Michi Mirror to learn English. Then <laughs> it was a good English teaching because we sang clearly. Yeah. So bottom line, I did a lot of teenage stuff, and that's what I was hoping to do when I came back to the States after nine, three years and nine trips. So I bumped into a guy I'd gone to the Michigan, Michigan with, and he said he just left the Captain Kangaroo show where he was a writer and a producer. And he said, I'm getting involved in a new kids show. Do you think you'd be interested in, aud in auditioning? And I said, not in the least. Because <laughs> I had this teenage image of myself here, but by then the Beatles had invaded and that never ever would have worked. But a couple of months later, Somebody called, and, and uh, I was somebody else, not my friend, and he said, we'd like you to come in and take a look. We've got a guy by the name of Jim Henson. I said, who's that? He's got Muppets. What are they? I knew nothing about any of that. And they said, because uh, we'd like to take, it, take a look. <clears throat> so I went in, and I saw five minutes or less of Muppets animation, film, and I thought, never mind those teenagers. I want to do this. So from that moment on, uh, I definitely wanted to do the show and turned out okay. 45 years. But, but, but we never, neither one of us knew that it was going to go on and on and oh, on. Oh gosh, no. Is yeah. even Joan Cooney, <coughs> whose brainchild it was, two years prior to the first show going on in 69, they had full two years worth of research from very, very bright people in every walk of life, psychiatrists, psychologists, and so forth. And even she <coughs> said, well, we'll give it a try for a year and see how it goes. <laughs> Here we are, 45 years later, in about 130 countries and in about 30 or 40 foreign co-productions. So it worked out as a pretty good little show. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I just remember, remember Danny Epstein? Yeah. He was a musical director for a while, and he always used to say, this is an experimental show, yeah. and we're going to keep experimenting until we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But I had no idea when I got the job. I was an actor. Uh, originally, I'm from California, so I, was, I started out working out there in television and theater and what have you. And I had been uh, a struggling actor for about nine, ten years in Hollywood, you know, nothing happening. And uh, so one day I got a call from uh, New York. They said, Mr. Delgado, we'd like to know if you'd like to speak with our executive producer. He's going to Los Angeles and would like to interview you for this, our show, Sesame Street. I had no idea what that show was. I had never watched it before, but I was looking at my last unemployment check. I, I had just put a quarter of gas into my car, and, and I thought, uh, a job? Yeah, okay, of course. So I met with them, you know, and... Uh, and the executive producer had come out and then, uh, you know, interviewed. I didn't audition, didn't sing, didn't dance, didn't do anything. And then uh, about a month later, the executive director producer came out. And then he asked me, do you speak Spanish? Yes, of course. Uh, and they said, uh, can you dance? Yeah, sure. I, I, whatever. Can you yes. play guitar? Can you play yeah. guitar? Can you sing? Uh, yeah. Okay. Terrific. He says, would you shave off your mustache? I, because at that time, I, I had a mustache. Yeah. <laughs> He said, would you shave off your mustache? And I said, I'll shave off anything. Just give me the job. <laughs> so then, uh, so he said, right then and there, he said, okay, if you want to work for us, be in New York October 11th. This was 1971. And he says, we'll send you the ticket. And I said, okay. <laughs> I got the job. That was it, you know. And then it was like space travel. I went from Los Angeles to New York. It was like going from one planet to another. <laughs> it was amazing. You know, cultural shock completely, you know. And uh, what did I know? It was going to last a year, two years at the most, you know. It was a, I was an actor. I had a job. Who knows how long it was going to last. And there it went on. 10, 20, 30, 44 yeah. years. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much. Yeah, and you definitely cemented the legacy. You guys are just, you know, like I said, I talked to you a little bit the other day about it. Like now, my kids are now yeah, watching yeah. Sesame, and just like it's crazy to think like it's like now like what three or four generations now of probably families that watch Sesame Street with their kids. So thank you guys. Yeah. You're welcome. You're, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if there was uh, some guests that stand out in your mind where. You personally and the cast was really awestruck by when they were on set that time. If the if the guests were awestruck, no, the the cast was oh, the awestruck. Because the there were a lot of guests that so. were awestruck also. Right, yeah, they they lined yeah. up around the corner to get on the show. By the way, they yeah. were, a lot of people were turned down. But uh, you always know when the, when the celebrities uh, had kids because they wanted to be on Sesame yeah. Street. It was the most important thing they'd ever done. Uh, Celebrities that, that we were inspired by? Yeah, that you were excited for when they were yeah. uh, on set. A lot of them. Uh, yeah, Lots almost everyone. Somebody asked me a couple of times, what's your favorite remembrance of the show or your highlight? And I said, well, it's a toss-up between a hug from Fred Rogers and a peck in the cheap from Beyonce. And, <laughs> and you know which one sort of won out, right? <laughs> no, the... the I, as a musician, I was a classically trained musician. I have my master's in music and so forth. So, I mean, all of the Beyonce's and the, and the uh, celebrity pop artists are always wonderful. But being a classical musician, I am thrilled every time we used to have someone like Itzhak Perlman and Yo-Yo Ma and Isaac Stern. And, uh, it, and they just go on and on and on. Great, great classical musicians. And they, do, they did Itzhak Perlman. I don't know if you're, how many of you know that name. Okay, good. He's a phenomenal viol violinist. And they did a very simple piece with, uh, with him one time. And it was a stage about this high with three or four steps. And a little girl came running up. You may have seen it. It's one of my favorite pieces of all time. Uh, it's so simple and so effective. And she comes running up with her violin under her arm, opens the violin, sits down, takes it out, and does a couple of octave up and down, very squeaky, right, and doesn't sound too good. Then Itzhak Perlman, who had polio as a child, and comes with his two canes, lumbering, difficult time to get up the steps, puts his violin down, opens it up, and plays, you know, some extraordinarily fast arpeggios up and down. And she just looks at him with her mouth open like she'd never heard anything like this in her whole life. And he just turned and he said, well, you know, 
Some things that are uh, hard for you are easy for me. And the contrast between not being able to walk and the difference of playing and so forth. And it was just a, it was such a simple and beautiful little piece of writing that, uh, I mean, we could go on for hours about how we were affected by each and every individual performer there. We've done some great well, I mean, For me, my, there were two icons that were on the show that, that I was totally flabbergasted when I met them. Linda Ronstadt. Yeah. And the other one who had been my idol from when I was a teenager and I, I, I tried to emulate him because when I was growing up, it was the folk era, right? And I was out there playing guitar and singing folk songs and all this, but Harry Belafonte walks yeah, in. Yeah, oh, yeah, Oh, my God. One of mine was uh, James Taylor, who we had... And then James we had Taylor, his yeah. records in our car. When my five kids were growing up, whenever trip, there was always... Uh, James was always playing. He came on the show. He couldn't have been nicer. Took some pictures with my two daughters, and uh, I saw him in concert about two years ago, and... Um, I was amazed. He, he's such a down-home kind of guy. He had a huge two or 3,000 people, but he came out and just allowed the crowd to come and meet anybody along the stage that wanted to shake hands and sign an autograph kind of thing. So, he's Yeah, and then, of course, uh, in the early years, do you remember when Michael Jackson was on? Oh, right. Wow, man. You, it was uh, an amazing And day, Ray you know. Charles was Ray a Charles. killer. Ray Charles. Yeah. You've... All these people, I mean, amazing. You know, we were there with them, you know. Yeah. This incredible talent. And, uh, personally, I wanted to thank you guys. Um, one of my first babysitters to this day says to me, hey, do you remember one plus one? That's when she, along with Sesame Street, first taught me how to count. And that's one of my earliest memories, and it's really special, and I'll always thank you guys. Oh, for man, it. that's great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. I'm glad we were a good babysitter. We'll send you some babysitting <laughs> bills before. <laughs> Leave a little something at the door. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, um, I love Sesame Street, and um, oh, you're the one. Both, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure everyone here does. Um, but specifically, so I am actually a developmental psychologist, and so I love Sesame Street both for my own childhood, but then also in a lot of the work I do, mm -hmm. um, especially in terms of like literacy and everything. Um, and so I was wondering, sort of, as actors. Um, how you guys see that process happening um, of the messages about literacy and about um, sort of generally the messages um, that you send to children on this fantastic show, um, how you see them developing and... How do you and, see it developing from Yeah, here? like how do you, how you see it, how you see like... Um, as the actors and not like the writers, um, like how does how does that develop? And we don't really have to worry. Yeah, we don't have to worry about that too much years. because two years, as I mentioned briefly before the show started, mm -hmm. they brought in all the top experts in every phase of child development <laughs> you could think of, and that is just as intense now, 45 years later. One might think, well, you got it right. You're all over the world. You're the biggest thing on the planet. <laughs> but no, Change because they, they know that everything changes year after year after year. And as of this 46th season, the original cast, with the exception of the two younger guys, Alan and Chris, we've all been graciously let go. <laughs> it's turned in from an hour to a half hour show. But <clears throat> from... I don't know, two of the rest of the country. In New York, our Mayor de Blasio wants to make sure he has a classroom for every pre-K student there. Mm -hmm. So that means that someone, depending on their birthday, could be three and a half going on four. And they feel that it's very difficult for kids thinking from the deep, most difficult uh, economical situation you can possibly imagine Coming into a classroom with middle and upper income kids, it's like walking on the moon for the first step for them. So they don't need, apparently, uh, at, because our, we're now really, our target now is like zero to three and a half or four. So they don't need maybe as much cognitive things, numbers, letters, shapes, and all that as they do social values because they have to know how to interact with other kids that they've never been in contact with before. And they have to know that there's going to be some discipline in their life in case there was never at home. So, for instance, Cookie Monster is teaching um, delayed gratification. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I think one of the pieces I heard... What's he had that? A, he had a, I'll tell you. 
he had a, like, I guess he had something like a whole, you know, two dozen chocolate chip cookies in a bowl. And he said, me want to slam dunk on chocolate chip cookie. But no, I have to wait. What am I going to do? I'll call Harry Monster for a play date. So they're teaching how you can hold off those kinds of things. And uh, also they're teaching executive functions and fancy sounding words, which really means it's gonna help these kids know how to assimilate into a classroom that's very, very diverse from what they may have known before. But they've got all the bright people out there still writing their shows and... Uh, wow, Bob, I'm really impressed, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I... I I was the, I, I had to learn this stuff. You were a teacher. I was well. I was a teacher for a while, but I didn't learn any of that stuff. Of course, you're, I, you're the expert. All through the years, of course, we were teaching. I mean, initially, yeah, we were teaching everybody uh, uh, one, two, three, and ABC, right? Which was, yeah, everybody needed to learn how to read and, and write and uh, start with arithmetic or whatever basic arithmetic. But as it turns out, later on, when we were talking to all the fans that had already grown up and had experienced all of those early years on Sesame Street. You know, I found out that it, that it wasn't necessarily just the ABCs and the one, two, threes that really hit to the core of the individual, but it was seeing and experiencing uh, um, a neighborhood of people, you know, that, that were of, of different colors and different ages, you know, and that, and that, and that uh, were in, the, in one neighborhood and they all lived together and helped each other and were kind to each other. And those, those values are, are the ones that really people, a lot of people learned I mean, not more than the ABC and the one, two, three, but that went along with it. And I think it was just as important as that other stuff. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And uh, I love pieces uh, early many years ago. Uh, I was supposed to meet uh, Gordon to go out for a jog. And I got there and he didn't show just up. Just on the show or uh, just in real life? No, in our show. Oh. <laughs> right off the one, two, three steps. And I, where is he, where is he, where is he? And when he came, I love the fact, I said, where have you been? I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. And it, was, and it was like a little bit of a conflict, in a polite conflict. And then, of course, we said, we laughed, we said, and we took off. But I thought, excuse me, I've been talking too much for three days. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful piece to show uh, an African-American and a white guy coming, maybe having a little bit of a disagreement or a little conflict, and then working it out and going off and having a great time. And I felt the same way <clears throat> was with Linda Bove, who was deaf on the show. That was, she was incredible. And you remember Linda Bove, anybody? I mean, yeah. she's deaf, yeah. you remember, yeah. yeah. She came to us with the Little Theater of the Deaf. She and her husband are both deaf, and they brought the whole company out, and she stood out amongst the whole crowd so much they, they hired her as a, as a regular. Oh yeah, she was terrific too. She was a great addition to the show. But when I do live concerts for large numbers of people, I, I just say, you know, if somebody wanted me to say hi to you like this, or you know, how are you? And they had all learned. They immediately said, Linda, Linda. And so they learned about uh, deafness for the first time ever. And one story of really quick came back later. A lady wrote into the show, and she said there was a deaf uncle in the family. And he, because he couldn't talk, the little kids, there were two or three, fours, you know, and they were rather frightened of him. They couldn't understand why he couldn't talk. And then the little girl that lived in the house became a fan of Linda and learned some signs. And the next time that he appeared at the door, she met him and said, hi, how are you? I love you. And other kids understood and they said from that moment on, he was just the most welcome person to ever come to their family reunion. So they did a lot to break that barrier between uh, hearing and, 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 and deafness. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. It's a long answer much. to a very simple question. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I was wondering, like, um, sort of how, how things sort of developed over time and if you guys got more involved or if, if sort of your experience on the show sort of changed the way you see things in it. Apparently, Absolutely. it seems like No it question. Yeah, and we're definitely. seeing that, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think one of the wonderful things of being here uh, you know, sometimes the passerbys are more interesting than the people standing behind the, the booths. <laughs> but we've had a number of families who have had children uh, who are challenged. And yesterday, I think we had two or three families with pretty severe autistic children. 
And what they have learned, what they told us they have learned from watching the show is that this boy was 22 years old, and she said he didn't speak till he was six, and he learned to read on the show. And she said when we'd read to him, if we mispronounced or wrote a letter wrong, he'd, he'd immediately point it out. <laughs> and another little boy just has this incredible encyclopedic uh, kind of mind. He remembered verbatim dialogue between Linda and I and even played back, signed back all of the conversation that we had. It's just extraordinary what these kids have in their mind, uh, in their in their brains. So that's that's been the most rewarding part of being here for three days. It's fantastic. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, I grew up with Sesame Street. Love your hair. So. Yeah, when did you turn blonde? <laughs> <laughs> now just wig. You're cute. Thank you. Um, Sesame Street holds a special place in my heart. And just want to thank you guys for being a, a part of it. A little closer to the mic. Oh, so sorry. Can... <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if this has been asked yet, but how long did it take you to interact with the puppets and not necessarily the people because they're below them? <laughs> good question. That's a good yeah. question. Well, a lot of people ask that question, you know, because they think, okay, who are you, who are you listening to? The guy under the table or, or you know, the, the puppets that's in front of you? Uh, with me, uh, when I came on the show, it was not difficult at all to suspend disbelief with these guys, you know. And, and the reason being, very simply, that these puppeteers are, are master puppeteers and they make these puppets come alive. So when, when you're interacting with a puppet, it's like you're talking to a real person. I mean, it's really that way, you know. And of course, we have a script that everybody's going by. And, and uh, you're not talking to, you, you can't be talking to the guy down here right. on camera, you know. But still, that suspension of disbelief is, is it helps a lot. And, and the, the talent of these, these puppeteers, you know, is amazing, really amazing, you know. Every one of them, Jerry Nelson, yeah. and, yeah. Frank, uh, Frank Oz, and, and yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah. And I'll tell you, if you're not paying Really close, because they have very, very sharp minds, especially Frank Oz and Jim Henson and Jerry Nelson and all the others. If you're not really concentrating on the dialogue and what they're saying, you're going to look like the dummy puppet and they're going to look like the sprite person. I'll tell you, because it happened a couple of times. You, you wind monitors and you know, mind wanders. But uh, I did lots and lots of pieces, the first, especially in the first two years when there were only four of us with uh, Big Bird and Oscar de Rauch both played by Carol Spinney. And when he dresses with his whole legs on first and then the body and the, and the neck and the head is all one piece that someone comes and puts on him. When he's in that costume, I just, I can't even visualize Carol being in there like this with his arm manipulating. He puts his hand, puts his hand in the head. Yeah. Right? That's the and this manipulates the beak He's got a little string around his left finger that opens and shuts the eyes. And his left, there's a little filament from the tip of his left wing up under his beak down to his right wing. So that acts like a little lever going back and forth. And uh, he's absolute genius in that, in that costume and everything he does. And such a contrast between, you know, have a rotten day and... Uh, Oh, yeah, I'm Big Bird. <laughs> so. what, what was the other question that you had? There was two yeah, questions? Just one. Oh, or just one, okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So it's, it's not hard to, uh, to... It was really quite easy, as Emilio said. They are so credible, and the scripts are so well written. If it was badly written, you'd feel like you were doing ding-dong schoolhouse kind of thing or some, some silly... I'm, if that was a show, I'm sorry. But, but you're right. You know, you have to be really sharp when you're, when you're performing with the Muppeteers because these guys are like, oh. I mean, they'll take <laughs> off on something. They'll improvise, you know. And it's, if it's not in the script, it'll throw an actor, yeah. you know. So, so we got used to really playing with them. Whatever's, whatever's yeah. happening there, you have to go with it, you know. Uh, although you do have to sort of keep to the script because it, it, there's a curriculum that yeah. we're teaching, you know. <laughs> the, one, the one that was most challenging for me and, and fun and fun really kept me alive and alert and awake with the, all the people in your neighborhoods that I did. Uh, if you, know, you remember that song, Who Are the People in Your Neighborhood? Uh, and yeah, of course. So we did most of those with Frank and Jim, Jim Henson and Frank Oz. And the tracks, the musical tracks are pre-recorded and then we sing live to that. So 
they might be a baker or a doctor or fireman or something, and uh, they come out and you kind of have to, uh, to guess, you know, who they are, or they have to give you clues. And there's only like, you know, when they finish talking, there's only like uh, two seconds before you have to sing, oh, the baker is the one who makes, whatever it might be. And invariably, they'd find a different pun on every take to try and make me want to die down laughing. And uh, that was challenging to keep your wits about you when you had to say, oh, the last jump in on the right time and still counting beats to when you sing. And I got to say that, you know, uh, uh, to give the puppeteers credit that each one of these people in their own right are like stand-up comedians. Yeah. They're, they, they're filmmakers. They're artists. I mean, other than doing the, the puppet stuff, you know, these, these are incredibly talented people. Like uh, uh, Carol Spinney, who does Big Bird, is a marvelous artist who yeah. just does these incredible, you know, fantastical drawings and paintings, you know. So very talented people. Uh. All right. I see one coming up right okay. now. Hi. Hello. Ian. Hello. <laughs> um, I want, it's two questions. Who were your favorite puppets and... I mean, I don't, yeah, I guess this, like Snuff and Luffles or Bird and Ernie. And also, what are your, you mentioned Captain Kangaroo and Fred Rogers. What are your favorite youth shows now and then or, yeah? I never watched children's television. Or, or, <laughs> no, well, no. no, go ahead. If, if you, you got, have, like, great, no. you have, like, because you, uh, you have grandsons or granddaughters or nieces or nephews or, yeah, shows that you would like them to watch besides. I didn't let my kids watch anything except Sesame Street and all that. <laughs> No, they watch some other thing, but that's been a long time ago. They're all out and out of college, and well, I got young grandchildren. Yeah. I don't know what they're watching, to tell you the truth. Okay. I think <laughs> WW and my two grandsons, you know, they're wrestlers. So, okay. Uh, okay. yeah, I met those two guys and uh, I took a picture. They were giving me a stranglehold in our oh, hotel, nice. so I, I thought they'd get a kick out of that. <laughs> but I, I'm, I quite honestly, I never have time to watch television during the day, and I should be up to speed. Uh, there were a number of great shows at our time going, including Between the Lions, which was also produced uh, through, actually through yeah, Sesame. It was Children's Television Workshop yeah. at that time. Yeah. And um, Nickelodeon had a number of good shows. I don't know them off the top of my head, but PBS now has really created a whole lineup. And, and we've got an electric company. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, you guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. With Rita Moreno. Yeah. We just, just as a PS, not your question, but uh, Sonia Manzano was just awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award with the Emmys. She was a wonderful actress, came to us from Carnegie Mellon with Godspell that came to Broadway, and that's where they found her. And she's also was one of our principal writers for many, many years. And she now has got she has a wonderful book out called uh, Becoming Maria, I think Becoming, it is. Becoming Maria, which it's is a her wonderful biography. Book. And it's her whole biography growing up in a tough part of the Bronx. And now she has a couple of children's books, and somebody just told me she's been commissioned for four or five more books. So uh, I started this for some reason. Why did I get it? What was the question? <laughs> uh, uh, what, and what favorite was the... characters, too, besides your favorite show, a favorite other show yeah. besides Sesame Street, and other, your favorite characters like, you know, Ernie or Bird or Cookie Monster right. or stuff yeah. like that. Well, I, I had a hard time distinguishing, uh, you go next, about uh, between Big Bird and Oscar. So we did so many pieces together, and Carol and I developed a really wonderful relationship right almost before the first year started. So that, those, but I love Grover, especially as a waiter, you know. <laughs> I am sorry. It, 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 he comes out and he drops the food. And oh, it, it is a wonderful choice, but that's the last one we had, you know. <laughs> Grover was great. He was. He was He was a very lovable character. Yeah. My, I always loved Big Bird. I mean, because yeah. Big Bird to me was, was that, that five-year-old child that we were trying to you know, reach so with everything that we did. And, and just Carol Spinney's personality yeah. as Big Bird, I mean, he really became that five-year-old, you know, that innocence and that... that uh, and he changed, you know, originally he was meant to be sort of a dumb, stupid bird. And was, he was always banging into the cross piece, getting into his nest and so forth. And I think about the end of the first year, he yeah. talked to John, he said, you know, uh, this isn't the right character for this bird. He also had sort of a silly looking head. They fixed that up after the first year. It was like it had been in a vice, and they've made it much more beautiful. But he said, I think 
the kids are going to relate very strongly to this character, and uh, we need to change his disposition. Yeah, and right? that's when uh, that's when Carol, uh, you know, started uh, started to change it from a, a dumb bird yeah. to to this five year old, and and then one day he just came up with a voice, and then there it was. Oh yeah, that's it. That's the five-year-old, and it, the same thing happened with uh, when he does Oscar. You know, it comes out of the can. He says, "Hey, whatever." <laughs> and he uh, told me he the day of the either first shooting or the pilot show, he had Big Bird's voice. You know, oh hi there, it's right up there kind of voice. But he said I could not think of who what Oscar's voice was going to be, and he jumped to the cab, and the cab driver said, "Where to, buddy?" And he said, "That's it." That's that was Oscar. the voice. <laughs> yeah, have a rotten day. Scram, beat it, bright eyes. By the time he got to the studio, he already had the voice for yeah. Oscar. <laughs> One day, he's, he's a lark besides a bird. He goes on <laughs> crazy things. One day, when we were shooting up on Broadway, and he just decided for the heck of it, he would go out and take a stroll down Broadway in the costume. And uh, he walked out the door. I followed him and <laughs> at a distance. And... New Yorkers are cool. Sometimes they're just like, hey, bird, you know, and they walk by, and some make a deal, but, but it, you know, there was guys who were, had had a little too much to drink, oh, the bird, you know. <laughs> so you met every kind of person possible, but it was, he had a, a funny, funny streak in him that would go out and do something like that. Oh, yeah, Carol Spinney. Yeah. yeah. And every once in a while, he, he would tell me that uh, he'd be someplace, ask Carol Spinney, you know, around the store buying something, and all of a sudden, he'd just come out with the Oscar voice, <laughs> and everybody'd go, <laughs> <laughs> Oscar! <laughs> I got to do one he? more quick, and I haven't <laughs> thought of this in years. They had a, uh, he had a, 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 he was in a bookstore, and he had a, a lot of product for sale, and he saw this little, and it was, he saw this little boy by himself. He was on one side of the aisle, and the kid was on the other. And he had found out this kid's name, Jimmy, somehow by hearing his mother. And of course, nobody knows who he is when he's out of costume. And so the mother had gone away, and <laughs> he he was playful. So he had this little, and there was a doll bird there. And so he said, "Oh, hi, Jimmy." And the kid's eyes go like this. He says, I hope you're having a good day. And this, and, and the kid is, ah, you know, and he's talking back and forth to the, for a few sentences. And all of a sudden, he sees his mother coming, and he thinks, this is not right. So he just scrammed and beat it. But he's probably, kid probably said, mommy, mommy, he's talking to me. You know, and yeah, yeah, sure he is. <laughs> Poor kid. <laughs> but he's got a wicked sense of humor. He does, yeah. He does. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We should have time for two final questions. I th just um, hang on, hang on a second. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, hi. No, no, I'm on stage with Emilio. No, I'm sorry. Uh, with Emilio and Bob. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, for Bob. Oh, you have great. a delivery for Bob McGrath. A what? Delivery for Bob McGrath. A delivery here? Yeah, right here in the room. Why? How could that be? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> hey. Hey, man. hey, it's Killer oh, Robots. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my hey. favorite. Krispy Kreme donuts. donuts. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know who these guys are, right? <laughs> wow. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank oh, you very much. We got much. lunch. We'll chat about a special delivery. <laughs> Everybody know. You, you, guys, you guys know these Hey, how you doing, buddy? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry it took us a while. <laughs> Sunny day, sweeping the clouds away. Everybody. Buddy. On my, on my way, way to where the air is sweet. Can and you tell us how to get, how to get to right, right that way, uh, right, right through the door. How about a big hand for all everybody? The, the robots, the robots. All right, man. Uh. Dude, was this a UPS or a FedEx delivery? Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Sorry it took us so long. It only was like three months in post, but we got it here. <laughs> Enjoy the donuts. Thank we you. will. We'll pass them on. I want a big hand for all our fans. Ah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause.
for Mr. Amelia Delgado, Mr. Bob McGrath. Thanks. Thank Thanks you so much for coming out for Thank Florida you. Supercon.